Aloha, welcome to Living Delicious with Helena, new series, Dying Delicious. We can talk about life and on the end of the life, we all face the death. And now it has been a very hot and steaming topic about dying with dignity or not about that law. And last time I had a guest, Robert Orfali, the author of Death with Dignity and Grieving the Soulmate. Today, Robert is back with us to discuss new things that have been happening in the state of Hawaii. Hawaii. Welcome, Hi. Robert. Thanks, Thank you, Rita. Thank you for coming back. So, what is new? Last time we were talking about wanting to make Hawaii another state. Right. And somehow it appears that Hawaii is or could be already the fourth state as we had in the newspapers, we had this big ad saying, is physician assisted dying already legal in Hawaii? Can you tell us more about that? Right, so this was an ad for a, uh, a conference that took place on October 5th at the state capitol. And it was hosted by Blake Oshiro, who's a ho House, Democratic, I mean, House Majority Leader. And the guest of honor was Catherine Tucker, who was a uh, Supreme, Court, Supreme Court lawyer who argued quite a few of the landmark cases on the end of life in, on the Supreme Court. So the thesis, say, what, last time I spoke to you, uh -huh. I was trying to pass an Oregon-like law. Remember, yes. we had this big discussion. And I told you that every time we try to pass this law, you know, we get stuck in committee. We can't get unstuck because we're asking for permission. And what was new is that we did not have to ask for permission. The permission was granted 100 years ago. And as a matter of fact, Hawaii has enough laws now that form a constellation of laws where it is completely legal to do it in Hawaii. It doesn't require any permission. There is no prohibition against assisted dying in Hawaii. And this is exactly what Catherine Tucker came and spoke about. And there was a, a whole bunch of lawyers and doctors, you know, in. Uh, as part of the uh, conference, and you know, we agreed that it, it looked like it was doable, and, and it's going to happen. It can it can happen any time, and this is what we're going to discuss. You know how you know how how it could happen in Hawaii, and okay. So now you're going to ask me uh, why didn't I know about this earlier when Jerry was dying? Of course, you know that would have been very helpful to know, but uh, we didn't know. Our minds were so focused on asking for permission and trying to pass an Oregon-like law that we never you know, even thought about the possibility mm -hmm. that it was already legal. It was already, you know, there was no prohibition. So, it, so for all the viewers, I'd like to introduce us to the law right. by reading it. Is that all right? Yeah. The law says that when a duly licensed physician pronounces a person affected with any disease, hopeless and beyond recovery, and gives a written certificate to that effect to the person affected or the person's attendant, nothing herein shall forbid any person from giving or furnishing any remedial agent or measure when so requested by or on a behalf of the affected person. It's Hawaii Revised Statute 4531. What does this really mean? Well, it means that the permission was granted 100 years ago. But as Catherine Tucker explained, Hawaii has a constellation of laws, just like the state of Montana, uh, where, as you know, Montana was a third state. And in Montana, the laws that existed, there was no prohibition against assisted dying. And so um, the, 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 the way the medical practice evolved in Montana is that you have, you know, uh, people, you know the patient has this bill of rights where a patient can ask for you know, not to be put on a respirator or can also have, uh, you know, the plug removed at the end of life. And doctors have evolved the practice of pain management, and Hawaii has a pain management law mm -hmm. that allows, it, it, it was passed in 2004, that allows a patient to request as much pain medicine as necessary, even if it causes death. If a person is terminally ill, they can have as much pain as management as, as a need. And plus, Hawaii is a state where they believe in patient self-determination and patient rights and patient privacy. So when you add all these laws together, they form a constellation. And then the fact that we had permission granted 
100 years ago, it's like the icing on the cake, if you want. How so, is that discovered? How come it okay, was not so, discovered uh, It was discovered, actually, okay, so let me give you some background. Uh, when I tried to reach compassion and choices, I was trying to get help in passing an Oregon-like law. And they came back and told me, no, you guys are like Montana. You don't need it. It's already legal. And I said, what, what are you talking about? You know, it's in, you know, what, legal. And they sent me a paper that was written by Catherine Tucker. And she argued the whole case based on, uh, you know, the pain law and, the, you know, all these other, you know, the patient self-determination law and, and the privacy laws and all that. Stuff. So we already had all this infrastructure in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then she also discovered, co-discovered with James Peach, who's a professor at UH, uh, you know, Richardson Law School, discovered that old law was still in the books and it was passed in 2000, it was passed in 19, uh, 1909, right? Mm -hmm. For the Hansen disease, lepr for the leprosy people. And By Father Damien? After Father Damien died, uh, Damien died, um, you know, they passed that law shortly after that because mm -hmm. they, they were the terminal patients of that time. You know, it was a chronic disease and there was a yes. way to die. And they were suffering. And they were suffering, right. And so basically, um, so Catherine said that this entire constellation makes Hawaii even stronger than Montana, where she just finished passing that law. Because Montana did not have anything like the 1909 law mm -hmm. that grants permission, in addition so, to the fact so that there's no prohibition. Hawaii has everything as Montana plus this right. one. Right, right. And so unlike a state like New York, where assisted dying is, is, is prohibited, mm -hmm. Hawaii has no, uh, the penal law of Hawaii, the, the, the criminal law of Hawaii, this has no penalty against assisted dying, assisted suicide, if you want. We don't call it suicide, by the way. Explain That's that what I exactly wanted to, yeah. to say, because your opponents call it physician assisted suicide. Okay, so that's the problem. If you call what we're doing assisted suicide, then when you pull the plug, it's also you know, suicide or murder. Or when you're giving somebody ter terminal sedation or palliative sedation at the end of their life, then you, you, you know, you're killing them. But nobody ever says that the physician is killing the patient because the, because the medical practice has evolved. But those patients are, are probably in coma or unconscious. No, they're not. They're just sitting there dying just, they're you know, sitting there and talking. They're, they're talking, and but when, when their pain gets to a certain level, they, they sedate them into unconsciousness because that's the only way to deal. Remember, we talked about that last time. It's and the you only still way, didn't convince me. But it's the only way to deal. Like, okay, a person comes in with a third degree burn. Mm -hmm. What do you do with them? You sedate them to the point of unconsciousness until you, know, you can figure out what to do with them. Well, if you have a dying patient, then uh, you sedate them and they never wake up again. You put them into a state of oblivion and mm -hmm. they die. So somebody, you know, is doing that. That's a doctor. The doctor decides when to sedate the patient. Well, in the case of assisted dying, the doctor gives you a prescription, and he's not necessarily there when you take it, and the patient can de decide whether they want to take the prescription or not. Mm -hmm. If they decide to take the prescription, they are self-sedating, as opposed to having a doctor sedate them, they're self-sedating. In other words, it's a suicide because they are no. freshly conscious well, let me and explain. aware. Look, Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens says, in the case of a dying patient, the choice is not whether to live or die. The, case, the, 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 the choice is only how to die. Mm -hmm. Because they already have a death sentence. They're already dying. Okay? So it's just a matter of picking the timing. In the United States today, out of two and a half million deaths, two million of them, that means four out of five deaths, are fit medically assisted. Life is, is being shortened at the end. Whether you what pull the plug, the ways, what are the ways of medical assistance? By, as you by are refusing treatment, now? Short, you're pulling the plug, pulling the respirator, pulling the dialysis machine, or in the hospices by terminal sedation or palliative sedation, where they give you basically they put they sedate you and then they discontinue hydration. So which one of those is causing the most suffering? Which one is the easiest for a patient? Oh. It depends on your situation, but okay, pulling the plug is easier for everybody because you're already attached to something. So it's just a matter of pulling the plug. Of course, nobody calls it suicide because the patient requests it through, an, like I said last time, through mm -hmm. an advanced directive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can't call that suicide or you don't call it murder. So we shouldn't use terms like suicide and murder and... and uh, so why is that word then used? Because, because it still comes back from the old, pro, you know, uh, religious prohibition against suicide that was in, in the books for hundreds of years mm -hmm. and now suicide is legal all through the US and in the Western world you know but assisted suicide is not legal in certain places not in Hawaii Hawaii it's totally legal but like New York for example assisted suicide is not legal but in Hawaii mm -hmm. there's no prohibition 
against assisted suicide, mm -hmm. but there's a prohibition against causing a suicide. And causing a suicide is not the same as assisting in a suicide. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so. Especially to a terminally ill patient. Uh, exactly. So a terminally ill patient has already decided that they want uh, the medicine. They already, you know, it's willing, they're doing it willingly. They, you know, they, they're competent. Mm -hmm. Two doctors have uh, seen them, determined that they were competent. The patient repeatedly asked for the medicine. At that point, you know, uh, the patient is totally aware of what they're doing. You know, the doctor is out of the picture other than providing the prescription. So for many of these patients, the prescription is a form of insurance in case things go wrong. They don't Do they take it? Uh, like in Oregon, half of them don't take it. They, they just, have it by themselves, they, but they still it don't take it. In case things go wrong. This is what happened to Jerry, my, my wife Jerry. She did, not, she did not necessarily want to take it. She was hoping just to, to go, naturally. But in case things went wrong, like the pain got completely out of control, or she couldn't breathe, then she wanted to have that prescription as a mm -hmm. form of insurance, mm -hmm. just in case. Like any other insurance, you hope not to use it, but you want it just in case. Mm -hmm. you know? Just like with your dog. You want your dog to die peacefully, but if it's a lot of pain, you exactly. euthanize your dog. So, to, so for yeah. patients, a lot of patients, just asking for that prescription is a very palliative thing. It's, uh, it gives them peace of mind. It, it relieves a terminal anxiety. And, and paradoxically, some of them even live longer, just the fact that they have that prescription. Oh, really? uh, yeah, because they re-engage life, they start eating again, they feel less anxious. See, one mm -hmm. of the things I was I'm not happy... waiting for death, I can choose it. Well, yeah, exactly. One of the things I was worrying pain. Jerry and myself was yeah. this anxiety that proceeds, you know, it's a cancer patient, and the cancer can go in any direction, and you don't know which organ is going to be affected. You don't know which tumor is going to hit against which nerve, or which, you know, a few bones start to go. So. A, a, t a terminal patient likes to have some form of insurance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't mean they're going to take it, but it just means that given how bad the system is, you know, in terms of how much pain there is at the end, even in the best of hospices, 25% of the patients in the last 10 days of their lives have intractable pain and, and another quarter of them can breathe. Where do you get those statistics from? In my from? book. <laughs> Check them. Where do you get the uh, statistics? They, they all to the come book. from primary sources. So everything in my book is, you know, primary. So there's 300. There's uh, there's 15 pages of references. Because I really want to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. And I want to interview the other side. Sure. And so just time to read my book too. Exactly. I'm yeah. thinking, are we coming with the same statistics? Right. And and I'll tell you which page to show them <laughs> when you get it. Okay. Chance. I want to know if they have okay. because now there will be on the December 8th there will be a conference. A title of the conference is Physician Assisted Living. Right. And you call it, you are pro physician assistant dying. And the conference is, let's see uh, the whole structure, but the conference is pro physician assistant living. In your opinion, what is the difference? It's an oxymoron. What does it mean, physician assisted living? You know, Prolonging the life. And we're talking it? about death with dignity here. You know, we're not talking about life. You know, we're talking about what to do about a dying patient. Okay, the dying patient doesn't have a choice. It's the choice is how to die. You know, so are we trying to elongate their life forever by putting them respirators, intubation? Are we trying to shorten it? You know, are we trying to make it, you know, you know, the suffering, you know, to be less at the end? I mean, what are we talking about? Shortening life by a couple of days. And that happens every day mm -hmm. in our intensive care units, in our hospices. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand what they're trying to make a point by playing with words. Will you be there? No, I'm not, I'm not going to. You know, well, maybe I'll be I there, be but there. it doesn't make a big difference. Uh, if you want, you can see their argument today. Okay, I want to, I, I, I've seen in today's paper, today's yeah. December, uh, November 30th, there is a paper, the big article says difficult dead decisions. So the opposing side what? of yours says, be aware of activists' false argument that an old Hawaii law allows assisted suicide. It does not. Great. So look at the two arguments, look at the two side-by-side uh, op-eds. Uh, -side, uh, uh, op this is our lawyer, a U.S. Supreme Court lawyer who specializes in end of life for the last 25 years, has done landmark case after landmark case, and this is their lawyer. So what does their lawyer come up with? The fact that uh, our, a, he's talking about our press release came out too early, great, and then it goes on and on. He doesn't have anything to say about the law except for one thing. He, he, he quibbles with that one word, remedial. Uh, remedial, yes. Uh, what does remedial mean? So if you look at Webster's Dictionary, remedial means either curative or providing relief. 
Well, obviously, a patient who is terminal mm -hmm. and has no hope, hopeless, according to that thing, mm -hmm. you can't cure that person. So basically, it means providing relief, mm -hmm. which is exactly what hospices do today. They provide relief by alleviating the pain, by allowing you to breathe better, by sedating you. Uh, by, you know, so that's what you do at the end. You manage the pain okay. to relief. So since this is what, By the way, this is what is called palliative care today. So the whole idea of palliative care is that you, don't, you can't cure the patient, but you can manage their symptoms and make them more comfortable at the end. Do you understand? Yes. So that's what the whole Not discussion is. Not to die in agony. So it, it has two points, the timing of our press release, and the second point is quibbling over the word remedial. Okay, but that's, uh, I don't want to, he's not here. If he would be here, I would love to see the panel discussion. Absolutely. I would love to see it. Now we have you, and we have viewers who all of us would die. So we have to see this. I'm wondering, because they said in the subtitle, be aware of the activists' fall. Okay, so why don't you read argument. the rest of the article? I cannot read the whole article <laughs> on the show. Uh, but... The question is, do you think that because of that they would try to repeal the 1909 law? Oh, that's another question. That's a good question. So yes, of course I expect them to do that. You know, other, I mean, it's starting, we're having, it's happening in Hawaii right now. Mm -hmm. As part of our conference there, Dr. Nathanson, who founded Hospice Hawaii, which is the oldest in, uh, hospice in Hawaii, uh, he's the a founder. First. Yeah, Dr. Robert Nathanson stood up and said, I'm willing, I kept my license because uh, uh, in case a day like today would have arrived, I would be wanting to participate and, and help dying patients. And he got a standing ovation from the audience. Mm -hmm. So we have a doctor who's ready to go. We have actually, we have a whole uh, group of doctors. You know, there's a whole panel of doctors now that are involved. Some of them are oncologists. And then we have patients that are going to be in touch with the doctors through Compassion and Choices Hawaii. Uh, a new organization that formed on the island. Uh, with the, the same people that helped in Oregon now formed you know, a group in Hawaii, but they bring in an um, incredible amount of knowledge, uh, you know, like a hotline where patients can call and get directed through all the steps, uh, you know, where they can get them in touch with hospice, where they can get them in touch with the right doctors, where they can, you know, you know sort of work Excuse them me, my the, question the was, dying. do you think they would repeal the law? Oh, yes, okay. That so was the, the question. They will try to repeal the law, but mm -hmm. this is an election year. And now let me remind you what we said last time. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to ask for permission than to defend an existing right. We mm -hmm. have already the right to do this. So we're defending a right, and when you have 71% 71 of the population, 7-1, mm -hmm. 4, and 17, 1, 7 against, trust me, it's a lot harder to pass a law that is completely unpopular during an election year you know, than yes. to defend a law that is highly popular. In other words, 71% of the Hawaiian public wants it, okay? However... Now, wait a second. So the politicians will have to listen to their public for once. Yes. Number two, let's, let's go back. Let's go back again. First, you have to get through the health committee. Then you have judicial committee. Then you have to get through the Senate and House floors where you have the debate. And then finally, you have to get to the governor, okay? Mm -hmm. And the governor has to sign the bill. Now, why don't you notice who else was on my panel? The head of the Democratic Party of Hawaii was on the panel. But wait, uh, wait, wait the same wait, thing was going on a few years ago. When what? Uh, for the last elections. So the last, a few years and ago. And it still didn't pass. A few years ago, it, in the House, if I remind you correctly, it was 30 to 20. It means 30 were for and 20 against. It failed in the Senate. So these people have to get it passed in both the House and the Senate and make sure the governor doesn't veto it. Okay? Okay, the question is, uh, my real question is, if, if so many people are for and were for before and it didn't pass, there must be a reason for it. What reason? Look at, <laughs> it's a bunch of legislators. It's reason, maybe. Legislators As are, we said. Legislators are afraid to take, this is a hot potato issue, okay? So I it told is. You, it's a moral, it's a religion right. issue. And that's what it is. They don't want the hot potato. They, they, but this time... The hot potato landed in their hands. Like I said, the turd is now in their pocket, not mm -hmm. ours. Remember before, we had to go out and beg for permission. Now yes. they have to go and beg for permission. But before this law, we had the same like Montana, same laws. The, the difference now is that we have same laws as Montana plus this one. We, yes, we have the realization that we have a very strong case. And by the way, Compassion and Choices is, has a legal team set together of local lawyers that are ready to defend this case for any physician. 
We, 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 they believe absolutely 100% that this law is totally defendable in any court. And just to remind you, in the United States, a physician has never been convicted yet of assisting a patient in a death. Until today, you know, I mean... What do you mean, uh, until today? Uh, today I mean, I mean, has... I mean to, to this day, no physician has ever... Uh, when Kavokin did it, when Kavokin did it, basically he, he shot a patient in the arm with a lethal injection. What we're talking about is uh, any patient who self-ingests, who takes the medicine themselves, there has never been a case where a physician has been prosecuted for that kind of situation. Okay, so this is... I think it's going to be very, very hard... And what's God got to do with that? God? Mm-hmm. You mean like sanctity, sanctity of life issues, I guess? Yes, yes, because uh, this is what we all inside. I'm talking with you, and it makes sense. But at the same time, I'm thinking my grandma is 88. I'm constantly thinking about those things. Okay. And everybody who is going to pass the law or not may have a little of, oh, my God, a conscious issue. So what is God's position on uh, intubation and having tubes removed? I'm asking you. I'm neutral. Okay, if God, I'm asking if God, you the questions, God, if, and I will ask them. If God questions. supports, you know, the physicians work every day in the Catholic Church every day when they sit there and remove life support, or they, you know, they they uh, give you terminal sedation in the better hospices, then, you know, it seems that that God would be mad at all of us. You know, it would be mad at all of medicine. Yeah, it's you know, you know, I believe that God gave us choice. You know, I mean, He gave us a mind to to choose. You know, He may have given us life, but He also gave us a mind to choose, you know, our options. And in this case, you know, we're asking, okay, let me ask you a question. So would God want us to live for the next 2,000 years intubated, <laughs> you know, in a cryogenic lab, you know, our body frozen, like I told you last time, like yes. Lenin's tomb or like a pharaoh? Yeah. Is this what God wants? I mean, I'm asking you, in the, in the age where they can keep you alive forever, what does God really want? Why don't we I'm very neutral on this. I, Okay, so today I the really want to come to the bottom of this. Okay, look, I want to find out what's going on, and I want to know what are our rights. Okay, well, because you know I was a nun. So I, right. have a, I have a religious background, and I have a lot of morality when it comes to all of that, and I'm just curiously sniffing around, seeing where it what comes from, what feels right to me, and talking about my grandma, how would I want, okay. if, I'm her, if I'm taking care of her completely. What would I do with so my I, grandma? And that was one of the biggest. Uh, um, the Catholic Church came with all these children, right? Saying, "No, you don't want to kill our grandma." Okay. So I'm very just neutrally thinking about realistic, because there are two parts. One is just a law, passing the law. Another one is when it comes to me, it will knock at our door, everybody's door. Okay. Let's let's try and get. I have one more thing to say about okay. God. I mean, today, physicians are playing God. You know, let's face it, if you want to know who owns our body today, it's a physician. It's not the Catholic Church, it's not us, it's our physicians. As a matter of fact, by passing this law now, we, the patient, have a chance to have a say in how we want to go, because we, either we take the, you know, the sleeping medicine or we don't. Then why do you think it's such a fight about this one law, yes or no? Okay. Why it's such a big deal then? I think that the Catholic Church lost the battle against, you know, um, uh, uh, suicide, and and they for some reason believe that this a patient asking for uh, sleeping pills to terminate the life by a few days is suicide, and they ha can get over that, and so they try to make any form of suicide as difficult as possible, because they can say it's you know they would love to see it being illegal, but the fact that it's not illegal, they decide that they're going to you know fight against that last battle that they have which mm -hmm. is this assisted suicide in some states, not Hawaii. See, Hawaii, we don't have that problem. But let's say in New York, they would, have, they would say, oh, we're going to stop anything that has to do with suicide. And so they decided to make a big last stand here on this issue for some odd reason. Because it's kind of funny because, you know, you would say, what, but you're murdering the patient every day by, mm -hmm. you know, by sedating them to death in, into oblivion. You're murdering them you know, by, by helping them to pull the plug. I mean, you're letting them go, right? So uh, for some reason, they can't see the connection between the two. They can't see that it's just another medical practice. Mm -hmm. It's simple. Now, let's go back to your grandma for a second. Are you worried that uh, we're going to get her to die prematurely because uh, now she has some pills? Are no, you... I'm worried if there is a miracle. Miracle? The, you know, she's kind of dying, and then suddenly she's completely happy and conscious. Then she doesn't take the pills. 
But if <laughs> she takes the pill before that moment, well, you mean then like it doesn't feel morally because I talked to her about that and she said when God takes me. Then it's she God's doesn't will. Have, nobody forces grandma to do anything. She does it's willing. This is not, you know, the Nazi Germany thing. <laughs> this is basically what we're trying to do here. <laughs> it's basically a patient that's been declared terminal by two pa two physi you know, physicians. Yeah. You know, all these CAT scans show that the cancer is growing or that ALS has progressed or whatever, right? Okay, so that would you be open for a, for a debate discussion if I would invite other people from the other side? Because I'm neutral, I would love to yes, watch you absolutely. talk. Yes, absolutely, but we need a bigger table. <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> we'll remove this table. So then another question also. What's next for Hawaii, in your opinion, when it comes to this? It's going to be like in Oregon, it's quietly patients and doctors are going to come together and, and, and dying patients are going to have, you know, decide they have one more option now on the table. So they have you know, palliative sedation, they can, they can have their living wills and they declare that they don't want to be intubated. And they have, you know, we're giving them one more option. Mm -hmm. And at an end of life system that is very capricious, where a lot of pain happens, it's good to have as many options that you can get. And let's say we have that option today. I think Hawaii who is Who would do it? Do uh, we have somebody who yes, would do yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. Who is that? Uh, we have Dr. Nathanson and a bunch of other doctors. I invite you to talk to um, a Compassion Choice representative on the island. Uh, her name is Juliet. Okay. And she can offer you some more information. Uh, and what about Dr. Nathanson? I invite you to talk to all our people. Dr. Okay. Nathanson, I invite you to talk to, you know, to Blake Oshiro and you know, uh, you know, Catherine Tucker when she's in town, uh, our lawyer. Our politicians, George yeah, Green. Yeah, yeah, please. You know, who and, I would love to talk to both sides at the same time. Uh, absolutely, and, and, and we can supply okay. you with all the people that you need. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. I'm glad, and we're gonna <laughs> okay. do something with that. Get to the bottom of it, and please, uh, for the previous shows, we already have two shows: one about grief, and the other one about death with dignity. And we went in really in the depth of it. Those shows have been already aired on Olela, but you can see them on YouTube if you just Google Die Delicious. They are this Die Delicious series. One, two, three, four, they will just be endlessly here until we get to the, to the conclusion. Okay. Or you can contact Robert or Fali, you can contact me, and let's see, oh, don't contact me, actually. Yeah, contact you, Robert. You can contact me, but you can call Compassion, uh, you can Google Compassion and Choices Hawaii, H-I dot org, mm -hmm. www. Compassion and Choices, H-I, Hawaii, dot org. Okay. And that's where you go for the information. Okay. Thank you so much, and see you later. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you.